and I think that kind of created my almost ethical North Star that I think I still, I hope I still honor and kind of guides me to this day. Yeah, you've, it, you've planted that flag, Nick, and, uh, you know, the one, it's, and we're not going to go deep into a whole lot of sports today, but like the one tweet that you have pinned on your on your Twitter is is, is was your three minute take on Cap, and I I mean it's, it's like a north star like this is where this is who I am and this is what I believe. And and that was I mean I'll look real quick. That had to be within the first two weeks of the TV show existing. It was the TV show started September fourth, twenty seventeen, and that is from. September 25th, 2017. So that's from, you know, start of the third or fourth week of the show. And pardon me, that's still something that uh, I'm, I, that's one of the things I'm most proud of that I've done on television. And that, that wasn't a political take. It was a take on race and equality and equal protection under the law. And there's a lot of stuff on TV that I wish I did be- do better. I I I was proud of how that one turned out. All right, so here let's uh, let let's go to Syracuse. Yep. And so I knew people that were at Syracuse when you were there, and the word on the street was that people would have their shows at Syracuse. No one would call. Nick Wright would have the show at Syracuse. Phone lines are full. So you already were you know you had something going on, and you were still. Very new at it. So, can you explain how that sort of almost immediately you were you had a feel for what you were doing? Well, the let me back it up just a little bit. I went to Syracuse. Syracuse WAR is a professionally run radio station that is on the Syracuse campus. That forever students have run the sports department, but it's an NPR and jazz station that has a bunch of adults, not students, that are DJs there, that are business people there, that are. Um, and the the thing that WAR has been famous for is the play-by-play staff, the play-by-play department. When I got there, on the play-by-play staff was Anish Shroff, who now is an ESPN play-by-play anchor, Jason Benetti, who's the voice of the Chicago White Sox and an ESPN play-by-play anchor, Jason Horowitz, who was on, if you remember that show, Dream Job, and has done had a lot of big jobs. I think he now works for Westwood One. Those were the juniors and seniors leading the staff. And the way that worked was... You would show up first semester freshman year at 4 in the morning once a week and do a two-minute sports update, the stuff that I killed you for not being able to do. Um, and, well, there's a, I, I mentioned that for a reason. And you would do that until you were cleared to do actual sports updates on the station. And once you're cleared for that, you would then do um, a practice play-by-play. And then after a year or so of that, you'd be cleared to actually call football, basketball, and lacrosse games. And as a sidebar to that, there was the talk show staff, which I believe was actually started by Adam Shine, uh, who's here in New York City and does a show on Mad Dog Sports Radio. And talk show staff, they didn't cut they they didn't cut people. It was aside from Shine, there weren't a ton of huge, high level success stories from it. While the play by play staff had Costas and Tarico and all these guys, right? Um, and so, uh, the, the, I went there and I was like, well, I'll work on the talk show staff and also do the play by play staff. And first semester tail end of first semester, sophomore year, I still had not been cleared to do sports updates because while I mocked you for not being able to do them, I, to this day, can't do them. And Jason Horowitz called me. And I'll, I'll never forget where I was. I was walking to my then girlfriend's dorm room at Syracuse, and he called me and he said, "Nick, I'm sorry. Like I know how hard you work. I know how much this means to you. To you, but he, but we got to cut you. Like so many kids go to Syracuse wanting to do this. That if by the end of your third semester you're not even cleared for updates, you're never going to be cleared for play-by-play. So I got cut, and it, that was tough, but. I had over that year and a half realized that what my real passion I thought was going to be was opinion and talk show. And so I really threw myself all into the talk show staff. I stayed I stayed there over winter break uh and to answer phone calls for the student fill-in shows. I I I just went all in on that and I ended up ultimately running that talk show staff. I 
had underneath me on that staff some true superstars. Uh, Mike Melter, who up until recently was doing mornings in Houston. Danny Parkins, who now does afternoons in Chicago. Andrew Filipponi does afternoons in Pittsburgh. Those guys were all juniors or sophomores when I was a senior there. And I also, going into my senior year at Syracuse, I thought I was going to get this one-in-a-million internship at WABC in New York. Uh, nation, it's basically nationwide. One person gets it. It's an apartment in New York. It's over $10,000. Internship at WABC. One person gets it. I came in second. And so I didn't have a backup plan. So I stayed at Syracuse and on Z89, which is just a full student-run station, but mostly music, sports on the weekends, I convinced them to let me over the summer, three days a week, host my own two-hour talk show. And that show was called What's Right with Nick Wright. And not getting that internship was the critical moment for me because that summer staying there, I actually got an idea of the type of host I wanted to be, what to do, how to do it. And so I I kept hosting that show and then I did the postgame shows for WAR. And then after college, I uh, had an offer full-time with benefits at ESPN Radio New York City to be a producer. Uh, Because I had interned there and I'd done a good job. And I turned that down to take a job offer back in Kansas City, part-time, $8 an hour, no benefits, producing the morning news show on a conservative news talk station during the week. And by producing, like assistant, assistant, assistant producing. I called police and fire stations, figure out everything that happened overnight. uh, Because I was promised by Alan Davis, someone that, changed my life by giving me that first chance uh that on Saturdays I could host what's right with Nick Wright for four hours and that's what I did and that's you know what I mean that's the that's the the kind of how I really got my first professional start after getting turned down for jobs in Snohomish County Washington and Kalamazoo and all these places for talk shows that did not want to hire me. I got a shot in Kansas City, and it was a blessing. I mean, to be able to start out in my hometown, and Kansas City is not a huge market, but it's a good sports market, and it's a good market for your first job, even if it's just Saturday afternoons for four hours. Okay, so you start out, you're doing a four-hour Saturday show. How long did that last before, I believe they gave you a night show where they were paying you, what, $18,000? No, no, no. No, that that eight dollars an hour still. Um, oh, that was a the yeah. So the the I, summer of '07, I start and I within a couple weeks that the weekend show starts. Uh, I by in January of 2008, Damon Amendolara, who was doing mornings, leaves the station to go to Miami, and there is some shuffling. And the night show opens up, and I get it. And so I do that night show at 8 bucks an hour from January of 08 until right around the start of baseball season in 09. And that was a big moment because so r- shortly after I get the night show, 610, my radio station in Kansas City, gets the Royals rights, which is great and a game changer for a radio station, but it's terrible for the night guy because unless you're the Chicago Cubs, almost all your games are at night. And so my six to nine show five days a week during baseball season became a non-existent show four out of five days a week. And around that, that was probably you know, a rough point in my life. I had just won 50 grand on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. I probably have some unresolved issues maybe relating to some of the things we discussed earlier. I'm During the summer, I'm basically unemployed. I'm not doing that news producing anymore. I'm doing a show, but the show doesn't exist during baseball season for four out of five days a week. So I'm doing a lot of gambling, probably drinking more than I should, certainly smoking more than I should. And most importantly, I'm not getting better. And so in that year, we have a Alan Davis leaves, Ryan McGuire comes in. And shortly after Ryan McGuire comes in, I let him know, listen, uh, if by this upcoming baseball season in 2009 you're not going to promote me, then please fire me because I have to be on the air. I have to be getting better. And uh, that was – and he said, basically, you're too young, not doing it. And But then they did it, and they offered me the midday show 
starting in April of 2009, and that's the one that the offer was 18000 I'm such a brilliant negotiator. I negotiated my way up to $23,400 a year, which got adjusted up to 24200 because I was like beneath the company allowed minimum for a full-time employee. Um, and I did that for a year, and that's when I really hit my stride. And as much as I love everything that I've done over the last decade, I don't start that from that moment until I left Kansas City, those three years of which you came in about midway, or you know, you came in right right around then, or a little bit into that, was maybe the most fun I've ever had uh, doing anything. It and because I was figuring it out, and I was getting in radio beefs and. We became the first show to ever beat 810, and after a year I got promoted to afternoons, and much to the chagrin of some, did that for a couple years, and that then led me led me to Houston. But that was that time in Kansas City. Well, that just makes me think about, you were going up against a guy by the name of Kevin Keatsman, who has now been fired from his own radio station, I believe, right. and you, this was a legend in Kansas City sports radio. And you willingly attacked him. You also attacked his midday host. Uh, and you're a good friend. My good friend, Sarin Petro, who has me on 810. And, you know, you're a young kid. So, you know, where, where, where's the, for lack of a better word, where's the, uh, the balls coming from? The ch- like, hey, man, I'm just going to go right at this guy and not worry what comes back at me. Well, I, it started with Petro. And uh, the thing was this. I knew how hard I was working. I also knew what I was making. And I knew how not hard some other people were working across the street at the other station. And I had an idea of how much they were making. And that probably annoyed me. And, what, what, I mean, what started the, the beef with your buddy Sir and Petro was every Friday for one hour he would do trivia. And it was, he might still, I don't know, but it was just the worst, the most awful radio imaginable. It's just such a mail it in. And so I pointed that out. And he got very, very mad and saw me at a Chiefs game or Chiefs practice one day and basically said, do you know who I am? And threatened my status in the town or whatever it was. But then I beat him. And because of the fact that I beat him and then there was one of our afternoon hosts uh, quit. There was kind of flux there. And that was, this is kind of an interesting thing. Our afternoon show was Chris and Cowboy. And Cowboy quit. And Chris uh, Hamblin, who I think doesn't like me now, um, he, he said to anyone who listen, if Cowboy quits, I'm leaving. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. So Cowboy then quits because Cowboy didn't like our new boss. And I went to Chris and I said, are you leaving? He said, absolutely. Don't want to be here. Don't want to be here. I said, are you sure? He said, yes. And I went on the air that day and I said, guys, you guys probably know Cowboy's left the radio station. Looks like we're going to have a new afternoon show. It should be me. And I made the case on the air as to why it should be me. And Chris got very upset at me. But I, was, I, I don't feel badly about that. He told me he didn't want the job. He wanted to leave. And I got it. And uh, and then I'm head-to-head against Keatsman, who had beaten everyone ever. He had beaten the long list of Kansas City people. And I said I was going to beat him. And it was brief, but I did beat him. And... I then had – my contract was coming up in Kansas City. Mike Meltzer, who I mentioned earlier, was working in Houston. Danny Parkins, who I mentioned earlier, by the way, at this point, had come to Kansas City and was doing the midday show. And Mike Meltzer told me there was a job opening coming up in Houston at the morning drive show. And I called uh, I called Gavin Spittle, the boss down there, and I said, Hey, uh, here are your morning shows coming open. It's going to be announced at the beginning of the week. I think I'm your guy. And I ended up being his guy. But you didn't want to leave, right? Like, Kansas City's your home. 
You're doing afternoons. You're a diehard Chiefs guy. 